wonderful position now where I actually feel more creative than I ever have. So I've been reading about urbex, um, urban exploration, and rurex, rural, rural exploration. I was fasc fascinated by the stuff I was finding online. It was hugely popular in the US and in Eastern Europe. Um, I'd also been tying with the idea of shooting nudes at the time, this is five years ago. Nudes are something, and, and fashion to a certain degree, is something that most young photographers want to do. But I never went through that phase. I never went through the, oh, I've got to shoot nudes, I've got to shoot nudes, I've got to do fashion, I've got to do fashion. It just never really, never really struck a chord with me at all. Um, however, five years ago seemed like the right time to do the nude thing. And it seemed like a good idea to start, as it also seemed like an interesting experiment to combine the nude and urban exploration. So it gave me a different angle, if you like, to try and combine both. Intruders was an exhibition that I had five years ago, and that phase was over. Um, you may have seen some of the shots earlier on popping up. Um, as exciting as that Intruders exhibition was, and it really, really was an exciting, um, I spent about seven, eight months going around different places in Ireland, breaking into old buildings, old houses, industrial uh, places, and I narrowed it down to my five favorite buildings and took these nudes back to the building. So it was, it was, it was an adventure. It was like a kid breaking into places. I'm not that I thought when I was a kid, I thought, but you felt the excitement that, I, that, that uh, you did when you were a kid. So anyway, I went to the new intruder thing, and uh, two and a half years ago, um, I was really lucky enough to meet a writer. And she was also very, very passionate about documenting what I would be shooting. So what we've done was, I invited her to come on a couple of break-ins with me, if you like, and the first place I took her on our first date was an abandoned asylum down the country. And we spent the day down there, and uh, she documented it for me. So ever since, we've been traveling around the country on various weekends when we have the time, and uh, looking for old abandoned houses, and trying to document the people who lived in those houses beforehand. So, let me just start, with, let's get closer to the death thing, I suppose. Um, some suggest that we die twice. Meaning, we physically die, and then a couple of generations down the road, we die again. Our name is lost. Our name ceases to exist, and is never mentioned again. Imagine a world where yesterday didn't exist. There were no photos, no documentation, and nothing to connect us to the past. The beauty of urbex and rurex is the ability to breathe a sigh back into the lives of the deceased, particularly those who have nobody left to tell their story, particularly those who have only died once. I was on an AIB shoot doing a commercial over in the northwest of Ireland. And after the job, I went into a pub in the local town. Um, and as is my want, I usually ask the barman or the locals about where them, there might be some interesting abandoned buildings. So he told me that he had purchased a house up the road from an old lady who had moved to a nursing home. He asked if I'd like the keys but warned that the house had not been lived in in 14 years. Bertie died four years ago at the age of 90. Needless to say, I grabbed the, the keys and told him I'd be back in 20 minutes. Three hours later, I returned. Bertie was a librarian for many years in the town. She also liked to travel, as I'd found from her book collection in her attic. She never married, had no kids, and no next of kin. One morning at the age of 80, and in poor health, she left the house never to return. I walked into the house and was immediately confronted by her slippers still under the fireplace. Time seems to have stood still throughout the house. Sometimes when I find a place like this, it can, it can become quite emotional. 
So it's important to relax before I start shooting. And I always try to get, get a sense of a person, of the, or the persons, by walking around the entire house and taking it in before I actually shoot. One thing that had me welling up was the small frame poems on top of the fireplace. One was a prayer for those who live alone, and the other the miracle of friendship. As with so many of these places around Ireland, religion is never far away. Um, so I'm telling you another little story here as well. I'm going to head to the West Coast now um, to visit Anthony and Kate. In a small rural community, Anthony and Kate chose to live out their lives as companions. Lovers, perhaps. They were first cousins. They had no children, and neither bore offspring. The legacy of their family home lost across the Atlantic to distant relatives on distant shores, possibly. And once the for sale sign has been removed, the future of their home and its contents look certain to end the landfill site. While he tended castle, or sorry, while he tended cattle, even, <laughs> she tended her modest hillside home until the day she left, never to return. A shoulder of liquor, the last remaining warmth and comfort in the cold, bleak winter of Anthony's solitude, before he followed Kate to another life. For every sort of ten places we infiltrate, if you like, uh, Probably nine out of ten are useless, and there's there's very little in the building. So there's always one thing though that you always find a Jesus on a chair. No matter what, there's always Jesus is somewhere, or the child of Prague, and if you're lucky, JFK will be there as well, and probably Padre Pio. Um, but there's always a chair, and chair was another project I worked on. But I'll talk about that today. Um, so what we'll do is when we find a, a place like Anthony and Kate's or Birdies, um. You get all excited and you go, oh, this is it. So you end up staying there for a couple of hours. So what happens then is uh, Patricia will um, go and meet the local people wherever they are, whether that's next door or a mile down the road or the shopkeeper, and we'll try and put together the story um, uh, in that way. And the lovely, the most interesting part about Anthony and Kate's was they were, they were cousins, but they were also lovers. And in a remote part of Ireland, it kind of made sense, but they, they couldn't actually say they were lovers, so we got kind of the nod and the wink from, from the shopkeeper to say that they lived together quite a lot and whatever, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so there was, a lot, there was a lot of evidence around the house that, that he was devastated when she did die. So a lot of the stuff belonged to her from Milton Mass that were kept in his room. He kept her clothes, he kept everything. So it was, it was quite, quite, quite a great find. So the stories kind of nearly tell themselves. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to move on to another um, arm of, 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 of urban exploration, or rural, rural exploration that really, really excites me, and that's lunatic asylums. Um, lunatic asylums, yeah, okay. Let me see. Okay, the excitement, adrenaline rush, and the range of emotions I get when entering one of these asylums is almost indescribable. It's only when you wander through the echoing wards and endless corridors that a sense of the layout of the day-to-day -day life of the patients can be surmised. It's really easy to get lost in the network of sterols. These, these places are enormous. Um, many of the emotions are sad, but I also feel very privileged because there's nothing that stirs me more than being reminded of my own mortality. In 2006, the Irish government signed up to a policy which would close and sell off its portfolio of psychiatric hospitals. Among these are some magnificent 19th century properties which had provided shelter to the homeless, the addicts, the mentally ill, the misfits, and the simply unwanted over the last 150 years. You could end up in one of these asylums for post-natal depression. You could end up for, I, I met one individual in, a, in a, an asylum or outside an asylum in Limerick who told me that this kid hit his dad when he was 14 years of age and his dad just had him committed to the asylum across the road and he got out when he was 53. So you could, be, you could end up in an asylum for the most ridiculous of reasons. There were really, really horrible places. 
Sadly, these asylums reflected the broader society at the time with its economic struggles and antiquated laws on committal. Many human stories have emerged over the years which afford us a glimpse of these experiences within these institutions. One of the rules of urban, I should explain, sorry, one of the rules of urban exploration and rural exploration is that when you find a building, you don't touch anything, and you don't art direct it, you don't go around and sort of, uh, you know, place and things that are already there. You should leave it exactly the way you found it. And one of the, the other rules, you never, you never take it. Because you leave the way open for the next urban exploration, Explorator <laughs> to go and uh, the same buzz because half the buzz is the hunt. I mean, and if you go around telling people, oh, there's a great, there's a great house down there, and there, people just go in, and then you get all sorts of individuals going in and wrecking the place, robbing the place, vandalizing the place. So that's why this, it's such a sort of hush hush thing about sharing your locations uh, that you do find. It's to leave the excitement, the hunt there for the next person to find. We're in a creative space here today, and many of you here are creatives. Through your work, your music, and your hobbies. Wouldn't it be wonderful to leave a legacy? Something that bears your hallmark, your personal stamp. Something that will be continued to be talked about years after your death. Something that will perhaps delay your second death. That's it. Thank you very much.